Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you, Andre, to just quickly come and say hi to you. So, Yandra is my plan B, my wife is my plan A, so she travels with me most of the time, but uh, last minute, if I don't have someone that can travel with me, he jumps in. Um, he's been with me to many nations, he's traveled with me for the last five years, and uh, it's not just about us traveling together, it's the uh, evangelistic anointing upon his life and the prophetic coming together. And so it's also a prophetic action of what God's doing uh, in the globe currently. So I'm going to ask him quickly just to come and greet you, please, Yandra. Just a slag and levious. Come. Amen. I bring you greetings from Mossel Bay. Um, excuse me if I am looking a bit tired. I have had a quite uh, rough a few weeks of, um, of traveling. Uh, we've been all over South Africa, Cape Town, all the way to Limpopo, and we are just preaching the gospel, spreading the love of Jesus, and we are seeing a hunger among the people of South Africa for the presence of God like never before. And it, it makes me so excited tonight. I'm so, I'm so tired as I'm standing here because of all the traveling. But it, it fuels my soul and my spirit when I'm among people that are hungry for God. And I want to encourage you tonight um, to keep this hunger that you guys are having tonight. You know, I, I travel to all different churches across South Africa from all ki kinds of denominations. And I see that there's a people that are... They've become familiar with the presence of God. God is moving among, among them, but they are not engaging with Him. And so tonight, I'm excited to see a people that's engaging with the presence of God. I want to encourage you tonight to keep this hunger, and God will meet you where, you, where you're at at that moment. Bless you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Um, I'm married for, for 14 years this year. And uh, I've got two boys, Zandra and Josh. My wife is an aesthetic doctor, so she does Botox, fillers, threads. This is all natural. No work done yet. But some of you need some help. I'll leave a business card after the service. Um, and uh, we've been traveling extensively for the last seven years. I've been part of a local ministry in South Africa. Um, I'm in ministry for 22 years this year. I was part of that local ministry for 15 years. And uh, it was never my intention to leave or to do, anything, to do anything else. And then the Lord spoke to me. I came back from an overseas trip, and the Lord said to me, I want you to move to Mossel Bay. And uh, we don't know anyone in Mossel Bay. We've never been there on vacation. And uh, I said, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Yes, we'll do it. And I just continued um, the same way, you know, how we've been conducting ministry. Then I left again for America. I came back on a trip, and when I waited for my luggage to arrive, the Lord spoke to me, he said, and this was, a, this was a year later. The Lord said to me, now you take your luggage, you take your children, wife, you do not go back to the home where you stay and you leave for Mossel Bay right now. Um, now, um, now, my vrouw is Afrikaans, and I can say for the jere, jere, ken i my vrouw. <laughs> and uh, I said, Lord, I mean, my wife is not, uh, we're not people that live out of suitcases. So it's taking, uh, taking our children on the road, and uh, I phoned my wife and I said, listen, you know, the Lord's been speaking to us for a year to go and uh, we have to go. I got her and the kids. We drove to Mossel Bay and uh, we got the first home that we can. We rented that place. We couldn't understand why God took us there out of, out of society, out of where we've been, out of relationships, friendships. Everything is in Pretoria where we came from. And uh, suddenly in a place where it's unknown. We don't know anyone there. There's no relationships there. And uh, we moved into a neighborhood, and there's a street. And uh, one day, after six months, the Lord, my wife said, so, so, so what, no. So six months later, nothing happened. We thought something extraordinary is going to happen when we moved to Mosul Bay. Nothing happened. And I mean, it was great the first two weeks to look at the ocean, but that's it. And then uh, um, my wife said, so, so what do we do now? And uh, I went for a walk. And I was, uh, you know, I, was, I wasn't at, at a good place spiritually because of what, where we've been at that moment. I couldn't understand, you know, what, what God was doing. And I walked down the street, and the, the street that we were staying in, I don't play golf. We, we live in a golf estate, but I don't play golf. And uh, the, there was a golf term. The street name is called Devot, Devot, Devot. And uh, the Lord said to me, go and read what that means. I went back to the house, and then I read on uh, the name. It's nothing spiritual, just the name of the street. And it says, uh, um, it basically explains the term in golf where you hit the ball and a piece of grass 
is relocated. And God spoke to me. He said, I'm busy rerouting you. I'm busy relocating you. And I'm putting you there. <clears throat> if I would stay in Pretoria, I would just root myself again. I would quickly connect with things again. And uh, um, I'm a very loyal, committed, and faithful person. I would never, you know, leave the ministry that we were in at that moment. And suddenly, God took us through a process of rerouting us and uh, separating us and releasing us from things that, uh, that was part of the previous season. You know, when God wants to take you into a new season, we want to take everything of the old into that new season. And God wants to set you free from the old. Abraham took Lot with him and he gave him a lot of problems. And so God wants to release you. I'm sharing this with you because we are in that place right now where God is busy releasing us from small-minded people. Doesn't mean that he is removing people from your life. I mean people that are limited in their capacity. They don't see what God can do. They don't see what God wants to do in East London. They don't see what God wants to do within the, in your city, in your family, within your community. And God is releasing you from people that have limited sight. And he wants to introduce you into relationships that has vision. Relationship, I call it kingdom-minded people. People that can look beyond this crisis that we're in right now. When you are in a storm, you need someone that can see beyond that storm at that moment. You don't want to be surrounded by people that can explain the size and the magnitude of the storm. You need someone that can look past that crisis and say, well, this is what God's doing. Job speaks about it. He says, there's just someone that can put his hand on God and put his hand on me. Just someone that, uh, that can bring a flow of the presence of God into my life at this moment. When you are in a crisis, you know, we are overwhelmed by what we are facing. And we need a stream of the presence of God in that moment to be able to propel us out of it and where he's taking us to. This is what God is doing with people tonight. God is propelling you into your destiny. This activation process has already started through this conference. God is busy releasing you from baggage, from weightiness, from small-mindedness, people that are holding you back, that's holding your destiny back, that's holding your calling back. And God is introducing you into new relationships. Now, unfortunately, God does not introduce you to the new, then remove the old. He first removes the old and then takes you into the new. And so he removes what has become your security, what has become your safety net, what has become your stability. You know, when God sent us seven years ago, and I said, okay, then, yes, Lord, I'll go. And God said to me, Andre, I'm sending you to 40 different nations. Will you go? I said, God, I'll go to one. It doesn't have to be 40. One is fine. But then I asked the Lord a question. I said, Lord, one thing that I ask of you is that my family would be able to go with me wherever I go. And God said, because you've asked that, I will, uh, I will honor you and I will provide for you supernaturally to take them with. And so my family has traveled the globe with me. Um, we are getting ready to do return to America. Um, we've got a couple of nations that we quickly have to visit before we head back to America. Um, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll head back, I think in October this year, we'll come back to South Africa. But they travel with me globally as we move. When God calls a person, he calls the family. Not just the husband or wife or children. They're all equally called when he calls you. So we've been traveling extensively as a family in doing what God has called us to do. But he had to come and release us from small-minded people. Most people do not understand my lifestyle. And I've stopped many years ago trying to explain to them <laughs> our situation, you know, how it works. We are not a normal family. <laughs> and you are not a normal family. When God starts to introduce you to the supernatural, there's going to be things in your life that you cannot explain. And most, most, most of the time is because you don't understand it. <laughs> but there's a spirit inside you and you know, you know the voice of God and you know the leading of the spirit. And so therefore, you establish a trust in the voice of God that wherever he sends you, that it will work out and everything will be fine. Amen? Let's pray together and get into the Word. Thank you, Father, for your Word tonight. And Lord, during this conference, every word that was spoken, everything that has been released, thank you, Lord, for everyone that's watching right now under the sound of the voices that spoke through this weekend, that, Father, change will come, provision will come, breakthrough will come, Lord. 
restoration will come. Thank you, Lord, for impartation that has already started to take place, Lord, that we are here in your presence right now. I declare that we are standing on holy ground. This is a holy place. You've set it apart. It has been prepared. Holy Spirit, come and move. Come and minister to us. Father, thank you for your purity that you come and there is no strangeness, no demonic force or influence can have any impact on, on this place or in this room tonight because of your presence that is here. Thank you, Lord, that people are set free. They're being released of any form of heaviness that is holding them back in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Read with me, book of John, chapter 4, verse 16. I'm going to change a couple of the scriptures tonight just under the leading of the Holy Spirit in what, what I sense is happening right now. Thank you again, Andre and Sonica, right? For, uh, for the opportunity to be here. I honor you, both of you, and also Hank um, and your wife. What is her name now? Ma? Maries. Ja, she is on the background, but the Lord brings her all the more forward. Anyway, thank you, uh, both of you, for the opportunity to share this platform with you. I, um, because of where we are right now, it, 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 uh, I couldn't come here. I couldn't be here. Uh, there's other things that I have to attend to places that I have to be, and so when uh, Pastor Andre invited me initially, I said to him that I just, I can't come. And a week after that, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Andre, I want you to be here. And uh, uh, um, I said, Lord, I mean, there's so many things that is happening. And God said, I want you to be here. There's something that's happened here in the spirit in the last two days. I want to say to you that, that, that man did not set this date. That God set the date. God sets the time. He prepares the place. There's things that's being, uh, that's being released in the Spirit here. And most of us will not understand the magnitude of it today. But you would see the fix of this years to come. You'll see what will happen. Because of what's being released in the Spirit. When God calls a moment like this, there's things that's being released that, that we don't understand. We think we're just coming together. We're having a conference again every year. But there's things that's happening in the atmosphere right here. In lockdown, I was in many churches um, globally. And uh, in that moment, I was in a very small church in America. And uh, about 30 people in the meeting in Virginia, Cumberland. While I was standing in that meeting in, during lockdown, where many churches and nations were closed at that moment, um, I stood in the meeting. And in a, in a split second, the Lord said to me, he said, he said to me, let me show you what's happening in the spirit. And suddenly I saw in the spirit what was happening in that meeting with 30 people. It seemed insignificant. It seemed small. I mean, the band was nothing like tonight. I mean, it was just, I don't know where they, they came from or what. But anyway, there was just no anointing. It was just, and God said to me, let me show you in the spirit what's happening. And in that moment, I saw prayers of churches globally that are praying. And they saying, Lord, we need breakthrough. We, pr we, need, we need to gather again. We need to come together again. And I saw that as we gathered 30 people there, that those churches' prayers are answered. While we gathered there, while we came together, I saw, I heard their prayers in the Spirit, and I could see how God is answering and, and bringing a release to nations because of 30 people that came together. <laughs> God can set nations free because we came together this weekend. Nations, not just churches. God can set the captives free. There's people that are praying right now that's crying out to God. God can set as we worship, as we come together, God can answer their prayers. He can touch them. He can bring a breakthrough in their crisis and in their situation right now. Amen? So many things is happening in the Spirit that we don't realize, that we don't see. But I'm here to say to, say to you that we are at the right place right now, the right time, and God will... God will bless our obedience. And also, Pastor Andre, for hosting this conference, for, for setting this moment, for setting this time. This is not just a conference. It is setting, it's, it's setting people up for what God wants to do in their lives and also in the future. Amen. Okay. Amen. So in short, what is happening? God is looking for an outflow in ministry and in business. I want you to write it down. God is looking for an outflow in ministry and in business. An outflow. We cannot stop the presence of God. 
Recently, I was in a, thunder sh- in a thunderstorm and God spoke to me in that thunderstorm. He said, where can you go to get out of this thunderstorm? You can put up an umbrella, you can sit in the car, you can drive under a bridge, but you cannot stop the rain. And God said to me, this is how my presence is flowing on the earth right now. No, no matter what you do, you can stop the flow in your life, in your church, in your business, but the presence of God is looking for outflow. It will find a place. It will find a church. It will find a business. God will awaken a little family in the middle of nowhere, and He will start awakening with them there because they're not limiting the flow of the presence of God. So God's presence right now is looking for outflow. Many of us are generous receivers, but we are not generous givers. We know, we know how to receive, but we don't know how to release. I'm not talking about money. We carry things upon us, but we don't want to release it. You carry gifting upon your life. You carry mantles upon your life. You carry anointing upon your life, and you don't want to release it. And the enemy does not want you to recognize what you carry. Because if you would recognize what you carry, you might release it. And he doesn't want that. He wants you to search your whole, your entire lifetime for something. But yet we're sitting with things that God has prepared us for that we are carrying right now. Giftings, certain anointings, certain mantles. And it's time to release. It's time to release what we have. Now we're talking about, I hear on these conferences many times, we, we talk about impartation. And so as we receive impartation, where do you go with that impartation? Because um, I don't think that you're going to get an invitation from Pastor Andre maybe to preach tomorrow morning. Hank is not going to phone you and say, listen, I want to sit under your ministry and serve you for the next two years. So where do you go with that impartation? What do you do with the gifting? What do you do with the anointing, the mantle that you carry? You take it back to your world. And so in the environment that you are functioning in, within that business domain, within that family, within your world, within your environment, that anointing has to be established within that place. It has to be released upon it. And so we are carriers of the glory, but we are also distributors of the glory. <laughs> so where we go, it has to be released within that, within that space. It's not God's plan to pour out His Spirit on the church or the temple, but on the earth. God doesn't have a place geographically where, where it's a holy place, where he wants to pour out his spirit in Jerusalem. All over the earth, God wants to pour out his, his spirit. All over. And so in your world, and I want you to understand that there's a responsibility. You signed up for something the last two days, and maybe you're not sure yet what you signed up for. But you signed the contract. You signed up and you said, I'm going to take this to my world. We've come together to receive, but then also to go and to release it within the place where we have authority, home, business, workspace. doesn't mean that you have to be the CEO of that company. In the work position where you are, you can be a fragrance of glory to those people in that atmosphere. Amen. So God's looking for outflow. Now, there's many churches, ministries. doesn't mean because it's a church, it's a kingdom-minded church. doesn't mean because it's a business, it's a kingdom-minded business. There's many churches and businesses that have limited the presence of God, that have stopped the flow of the Holy Spirit within that place. doesn't mean it's over. The Spirit of God just shifts to a different place. That rain is still coming. It's going to find a church. It's going to find a family. It's going to find a business that will allow the flow of the Spirit through through that business. So what's happening right now? Right now, God is reconstructing boundaries that have limited the flow of His presence. You see, God also loves people. And if I have put up boundaries that has limited the flow of His presence to people, then God's going to shift those boundaries. And this is what we're facing right now. I want to say to you that COVID is one of the best things that could have happened to the church. I'm not talking about death. I'm not talking about that is, that's the enemy that comes and steal, kills, and destroys. I'm not talking about that. But suddenly, it brought the church to a place where they realized where they were. They realized the boundaries, the limitations, the things that they've put in place to limit the presence of God, to stop the flow of God. So God is reconstructing boundaries 
These are man-made boundaries that we have put in place to limit the move of the Spirit. He's reconstructing it. God is saying, no more. I'm not going to allow a leader, a person to limit what I want to do in my children's lives. And so if someone has become a boundary, a border, a door to stop the flow of the presence of God into a community, God is going to relocate that person. Don't go and say, Andre said that God's going to kill people. That's not what I'm prophesying. <laughs> Don't go to your boss tomorrow morning and say, yeah, your days are over. <laughs> He's going to relocate those people. He's not going to allow families and his children to suffer because people have stopped the flow of his presence. The rain will find you. The presence of God will come to you. And nothing, no demon in hell can stop what God wants to do in your life. Amen. So John chapter 4, verse 6 to 19. says, Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? All of you know the scripture very well. Then Jesus starts to speak to her about this living water. He says, the water that you drink from here, you'll have to come here every day to come and draw water. He says, but I have water. And if you drink from this, he says, you will never thirst again. This is a revelation. You will never thirst again. Never thirst. If you drink from this water, you will never thirst again. <laughs> It means that there's an abiding a presence that comes upon your life. <laughs> the presence of God comes to rest. Never thirst again. It doesn't mean that I'm going to sit back and do nothing. No. It means that I, I become a carrier of the presence of God. I will, never th I, don't, I will never go through those ups and downs and ups and downs. Yes, the flesh. The flesh, but not the spirit. The spirit will be full and will overflow continually. I want to make a statement today and say to you, the day when I gave my life to Jesus, the, the enemy, the, the attack of the enemy on my life stopped. It didn't start, it stopped. Because the, you're talking about the flesh, the flesh has died, it belongs to him in any way. And so what life are you talking about? There's nothing that the enemy can steal from me. Because if the enemy steals from me, he steals from God. My life belongs to him. I've laid it down when I, when I received him. And so I do get flat tires, but it's not a demon, it's a flat tire. <laughs> get out of fix it and go on. Many attacks that people are referring to is financial crises of lack of wisdom or things that can be resolved. It's temporarily. The enemy is not after those things. He's after your soul, after your spirit. That's what he wants. And so those, those external things, yes, there's going to be storms in any way. But that, isn't, that is not attack of the enemy on my life. That's life. Life happens. Not the other word. Life happens. Okay. So we go through stuff in life. But we can become so, so spiritual minded that, that we don't, we start to use wordings and doctrines and things and we, we empower the enemy, and we gave him a lot more power than he deserves. He doesn't deserve anything. God is my protector. And there's a stamp upon my life that whenever he attacks me, he has to pay back sevenfold. It's a very bad investment to make when he touches me. <laughs> it's not my responsibility to claim the sevenfold. It's the kingdom that will take care of that. And so he can come and steal, but it's going to cost him. I want to say to you tonight that if the enemy steals from you, it's going to cost him. It's going to cost him. So he speaks to her, says to her, if you drink from this water, you will never thirst again. So he tells her about this water. This whole passage is about this water. It's about the spirit. And then at last, this woman says, now give me this water. I want it. Now give it to me. And then the next verse, he says, go call your husband does not make sense. I want to say to Jesus, Jesus, forget about the husband. We are talking about water now. <laughs> you have just 
You have just sold. I mean, this woman came here to draw water. You just told her that you have to drink from this water. And then she, <laughs> she agreed and she said, okay, I want this water. And then you say, go call your husband. Leave the husband. Let's talk about the water. Bring that everlasting water. That's what we want. So it's very, very strange. He jumps from, from the water suddenly. Go call your husband. It's, it's, complete, it's like a pastor that preaches one direction and suddenly goes to something completely opposite. Doesn't make sense at that moment. Then he says to her, go call your husband. He says, I don't have a husband. Then he says, yes, the five that you had is not your husband. Five. And the one that you are now with, number six, also not. And this would make... Jesus, husband number seven in her life at this moment. And something takes place at that moment, and he says to her, before I can release this water on you, I have to deal with obstructions that's in your life. Because if I would release the Spirit upon your life right now, the things that you carry would obstruct the flow of the Spirit in your life. So let's first deal with that. The water is going to come. The spirit will be released. But let's deal with obstruction within your spirit. And he deals with this situation. And what he is saying prophetically is he's saying that you have put your security in a man. You've put your identity in a man, in a relationship. And before I can release what I, what I have for you, I have to deal with that. And so he introduced husband number seven to her, Jesus, which is perfection. And he says that I want to be the center of your life. For you to be a carrier and to, be, to, to release any form of limitation upon your life. I have to become the center of your life. And so this woman has found so many things in those relationships. And specifically, her security, her identity, her safety in those relationships. That's why she jumped from relationship to relationship. That's why people jump from relationship to relationship today. They find identity or in that relationship. And Jesus says, before I can release the flow of my presence upon your life, we have to deal with that. And suddenly something happens. The body of Christ is right now at that place where not the world, the children of God are carrying things within their lives that has not been authorized by heaven. And God wants to bring, he wants to revive his children. He wants to bring restoration. But for that pure flow to flow through their lives, he has to deal with obstructions. He has to deal with things and shift things. There's people in this room, God wants to activate you, but before he can activate you, he has to deal with false securities. He has to deal with it. You can't <laughs> say, say, Lord, you are my everything. My, you are my foundation. You are my source. You are everything. At the same time, you're holding on to something and saying, without this, I can't live. I need this. Whether it's relationship, whether it's family, whether it's finances, whether it, at the same moment, you're holding on to that. You're saying, Lord, you are my source but you're leaning onto something. And you're saying, well, if I lose this, it's over for me. God wants to bring a release of His Spirit in our lives, but He needs 100% commitment from us. I can look at you and you can say many things to me tonight. Uh, there's things that you can hide. There's things that's in secret. God knows the motive and the intention of the heart. He knows exactly where you are. When God sent me to America... At that moment, we, we sowed many things. We gave up everything. We, we prepared ourselves to go. And then one morning, Lord spoke to me, and he said, uh, I had a savings account. And uh, me and my wife, we had the savings account. And over the years, we saved up in this account, many years. Everything we put in that account. And uh, I, uh, when Lord sent us seven years ago, I said, God, I'm ready to go. I have nothing. You are my source. You are my everything. And God said to me, Andre, what is that savings account? I said, God, that's easy. It's, 
It's when all else fails, and if it doesn't work out, then I have that. It's my plan B. God said to me, that's not trust. You have to get rid of that. I said, God, but I, I mean, we saved for 12 years. From the moment we got married, we saved, we saved money in that account, and we had about 550,000 rand in that account. God said, what is it? I said, Lord, it's not important. It's nothing. I mean, it's, <laughs> things don't work out. Just the safety net that we have. The Lord spoke to me. He said, Andre, for me to take you to the next level, you have to release safety nets in your life. You have to let go of things that's obstructing the, my presence in your life. I want you, you know, you've trusted me 70% but I want you to trust me 100%. And we came to a place where I realized that day, and this, God spoke to me personally about that situation. If God doesn't speak to you about the obstruction, don't create the obstruction in your life. If he speaks to you about the issue, then it's the issue. But, it, but there's things that, things that God spoke to other people, and, and it wasn't a challenge in my life, and so it's not a word for me. But he spoke to me about that, and I had, I had to choose what will I do. And it was challenging for us because it was our plan B. It was our back door. It was, uh, you know, if nothing worked out, we can could, we could go back to that. And we, it was a challenging moment. It wasn't easy for us. You know, Ink can tell you many stories. You just see the end result, the glory on Ink's life. <laughs> but he can tell you stories about where he's been, where, what God has done. Same thing with Pastor Andre. Places they've been. You know, people don't often share about that. They don't put that on Facebook. <laughs> but there's been a journey. And we had to let go of securities in our lives. Things that was our safety net. Where we had to go and say, God, now the only thing that we have is you. I'm going somewhere tonight. Don't worry. I'm just starting slowly. Slowly. <laughs> I don't want you you know, dislike me in the first five minutes. We can do that the last, the last five minutes. And so we dealt with that. I want you to quickly stand just where you are right now. Stand with me. I want you to close your eyes. There's a flow of the presence of God right now in this place. There's a flow of the presence of God. But before God can pour out His Spirit upon you, He wants to deal with obstructions, obstructions, things that's limiting the flow of His presence in your life. Filters that you've put in, false securities that you've put there. Plan B's, plan C's, plan D's. And it's limiting the flow of His presence in your life. Tonight, God wants to deal with that. He wants to deal with that. And so God will put your focus on that. He will reveal it to you. You don't need someone to come and reveal it to you. God will show you that this thing is an obstruction. This thing is limiting you. This is stopping what He wants to do in your life. It's become a false security. You know, right now it seems that that is a security, but I want to tell you the truth. It is a false security. The only thing that is stable is God. The only thing that's stable is His Word. Nothing else. We've seen the last two years people go from hero to zero. Companies have lost everything. Places, powers that has been there, that's been very powerful, very evident. Suddenly, the next morning they wake up and they are nothing. In a moment, a financial situation can change. In one moment. Investments can go bad in a moment. But what I'm referring to tonight is something that's everlasting, something that's eternity, that will never change, never stop. And that is Christ being the center of our lives. The center. There's people in this room that have prophesied over their own lives and you have prophesied and you've said, if I lose this, I will quit. If this doesn't work out, I will give up. If something happens to my family, I am done. You've prophesied things. You've said things in the atmosphere and those things are limiting you for where God wants to take you. Tonight, God wants to set you free from your own words that you've prophesied, things you've spoken into existence, but suddenly it's becoming a weight. It's holding you back. God's intention is to bless you, to prosper you. But He wants to deal with the obstruction tonight. Things that is limiting, things that you've put your identity in, your security in, your hope in, and you're thinking, well, my boss is my source. My parents are my source. South Africa is my source. God does not need the permission of this president to bless you. He can find a way. He can open up a well where there seems to be no well. He can do that. But he wants to be the center of it all. The center. 
And so tonight God is dealing with that right now. Father, I'm praying for every person that's right here. And Father, thank you for your presence that's flowing through their lives, that you are dealing with obstructions tonight. You're moving it out of the way. And Father, you are becoming the center of our lives once again. We're not holding onto false securities. We're holding onto you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. God is dealing with obstructions in your life. I want to say to you that even after this conference, the next week or two, God's going to deal with things. Even all of us are praying for larger capacity. Father, I want more. Give me a larger capacity. A larger capacity will require uncomfortable processes. Many of you have been through a lot of stuff the last two years, but you don't realize tonight that you have a larger capacity. You look in the mirror and the only thing you see is the challenges you've been through, but you don't see the capacity that you have. Suddenly you have greater capacity. You can handle so much more. You can go through. You only remember the fights and the challenges. I'm speaking to people tonight that have a larger capacity. You've been through things. So the next week, two weeks, God's going to speak to you about things personally. He's going to say, listen, you have to deal with this. You have to let it go. God came in very gently into my life, his spirit, and said to me, Andre, what, what is that? And he dealt with that. He took me through a process to release false securities in my life. He took, me through, he took me through that process. God's going to speak to you in this coming week about things that's limiting what he wants to do in your life. People are not your source. The place where you work, the person you are under, they're not your source. They are a source that God uses to bless you, but God is your source. Provision comes from Him. Everything comes from Him. And so I don't have to serve that person or bow to that person. They are not my source. You're thinking, well, I'm so afraid that if something happens that I'm going to lose that position. I cannot afford it. Listen, you cannot afford to make man your source. That's what you cannot afford. God has to be the, the center of it. And if a door closes, he will always open something else. You cannot live in fear every morning and worry that, that what, what's going to happen. They're busy retrenching people. People are leaving. Maybe I'm next. You cannot live that way. You have to know that God has positioned you there. He has placed you there and he will uphold you there. You don't have to fight for a position or for a place. Okay. Now, we receive through, through two different ways. I don't want to get too too complicated and spiritual tonight. We receive through two different ways. We receive by invitation or impartation. I want you to write down those two words, invitation and impartation. That's how we receive. In any religion that's out there, they have to work for it to get to a place. But as a son and daughter of God, we are invited. Invitation. We get an invitation to come. He says, come. We are invited. He says, those who are weary, come. Come and drink. It's an invitation. So we receive through invitations and impartations. People that impart, you have to get this tonight. People that impart. I'm speaking about Hank and Andre tonight. People that impart are people who responded to invitations in their lives. Because they responded to invitations, they carry something now that they can impart. So we receive through an invitation or an impartation. Same way that God called me, he invited me, and I was obedient, and I stepped into what he had for me. Now I received it, and I can release it. I can impart it to people. It's two different flows. But tonight, I don't want to focus on impartation, but invitations. To, uh, I believe that this morning, many of you have been, hands has been laid upon you. And so it's been imparted to you, this impartation that took place. But tonight I want to focus on invitations. Okay, let me explain, let me explain invitations to you. The enemy works with cycles. God works with seasons. Very different the two. A cycle can be formed where the same thing happens or reoccurs at the same time, every year, every month, every 10 years, it's a cycle that the enemy creates. The enemy is too stupid to think about new ways 
to attack you. So he uses the first one that worked. And he creates a cycle. So you grow up and you go through pain and, and it worked. Rejection, it worked. And so now he uses the same thing, it becomes a cycle. And throughout your life you have to face that cycles. Cycles we can break. We can pray over a person and break a cycle upon their life. It's demonic. The enemy uses cycles. God uses seasons. Seasons flow in harmony with one another. Winter don't push summer. They flow in harmony with one another. Now, invitations comes once in a season. A season can be a year, can be six months, can be 10 years, can be 40 years. It's different time frames of season spiritually. So an invitation comes once in a season, okay? If you miss that invitation, you have to wait for the invitation to come back in its season. When you miss the invitation, you enter a desert period that God never intended for you. And suddenly you're stuck in a place and you have to wait for the invitation to come to be released from that season. A lot of people go through things that God never planned for them. But because of their disobedience, they send themselves to the desert. David says, even though I choose to go through the valley. He didn't send him. He chose to go through it. God never sends us to the valley. We, <laughs> because of our disobedience, we choose to go through the desert experience. Because we hear God and then we don't respond. That season in Mossel Bay was a desert experience for me. God spoke to me. He said, it's time to go. I said, yes, I'll go. And I did nothing about it. A year later, it became a desert experience. Suddenly, we went and we, we got stuck in six months. And it was a very challenging six months for us. God never intended for us to go through that time. He sent us. He spoke to me in advance. But we disobeyed. I didn't respond. I didn't do it. Now, don't feel guilty. <laughs> a lot of us miss what God has for us. Let me tell you the great thing about a desert experience is that when the invitation comes, you will be as ready as you can be. <laughs> you won't miss it again. I mean, you will sit there and wait for that, that moment to come. And so a desert experience creates awareness as well, a sensitivity for the voice of God. Jesus went into the desert, came out, and suddenly there was, there was a, a sensitivity that came upon him to be led by the Spirit. Happens within a desert experience. But I want to speak to you about it. I want to make you aware of the invitations tonight so that when it comes, that you are ready to respond to it. Many of the things that, that we went through the last six years of our lives is things that God never intended for us. It, it was purely disobedience. We were just not ready for it. If I say ready, we, we didn't have agreement in our family. We, uh, we postponed it. Uh, we delayed it. We, but we've learned through that process to obey and to trust the voice of God. Now, as a father, God always tries to prepare us for what is to come. God is speaking to you now about things that he's going to do the next two, three years in your life. You might sit here and, and have no idea or no clue about what you're hearing, but God is preparing you for what is to come, what is to come, where you're going, what he's setting you up for. As a father, he's preparing you. God doesn't want you to get to the cliff and then jump off and then on the, on the falling say to you, oh, by the way, this is what you... No, he prepares you way in advance for what is to come, and he prepares you by invitations. He invites you. He speaks to you. It comes over and over and over and uh, he puts it through dreams, visions, starts to speak to you about where he wants you to go. I want to stir up something within your spirit tonight that when the invitation comes, you'll respond. You'll be ready to go. You won't stand back. You know, I want to say, I want to tell the truth to you. Confirmations is the opposite of invitations. When you get an invitation, there's no time for confirmation. When you get an invitation, you have to listen to the shepherd's voice. You have to be ready to move. By the time you get the confirmation, the invitations are gone. Invitation is great. If you, if you came to Christ this morning, confirmations is great in your life. But if you've been serving God for a year, 
and you still rely on confirmations the whole time, you have to mature. They have to grow up. The day when I got married, I gave my vows to my wife. I said to her, listen, I'll love you. I'll do this. Now we're in covenant, we're in relationship. And so when I come into my home after 10 or 14 years of marriage, my wife doesn't say, no, no, wait, before you come in, first say those vows again there before you come in. I'm in relationship with God. If God speaks to me today and I say to him, confirm it, then God says to me, Andre, come on. We're in relationship. <laughs> I've been walking, for, walking with you. What do I have to confirm? I've led you the last 10, 22 years of your life. Let's go. Confirmation is a very religious way to postpone the plan of God. Sounds spiritual. Sounds beautiful. But by the time you get your confirmation, God's going to use someone else. Why? Because the Spirit flows. If you stop it, it's going to find. So again, if you just came to Christ, pray for confirmations. Pray for it. But when you are serving Him, you know His voice. You know the shepherd's voice. You're ready to act. You're ready to move when He speaks to you. So we receive by impartation. Someone responded to invitation, and therefore they carry it upon their lives and they can release it. But I'm referring to invitations tonight so the same way those people responded to invitations, you can respond to invitations in your life. When God speaks to you, you're ready to step into what he has for you. Now, let me read the scripture to you. 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. He says, so friends, confirm God's invitation to you. So friends, confirm God's invitation to you. What is he inviting you to? You have to be sure. You can't wonder, well, I'm not really sure. Confirm it. Make sure that you know what God's invitation is to you. Then he says, don't put it off. Do it now. Do this and you'll have your life on firm footing. The streets paved and the way wide open into the eternal kingdom. He says, don't put it off. Do it now. Do this and you will, you will have your life on firm footing. Firm footing. There will be a stability. Even though the whole world falls apart around you, you will know the direction that you're supposed to move in. You've confirmed that. Romans chapter 1 verse 11. He says, I long to see you, Paul writes, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Impartation that you receive today. Acts chapter 3 verse 6. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have. But what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be healed. You know, when, when he stood in front of that sick person, he didn't say, well, give me five minutes, let me go and pray. Father, he's really sick. Please, empower me right now. Give me the gift of healing so that I can heal him. Come on, Lord, he's sick. No. There's something that happens in his life, and this is what I want you to realize right now. There's a, a gifting that you carry, and until you accept it, the authority level will remain at the same place in your life. Paul says, he says, silver or gold I don't have, but what I have, I've accepted the gifting that's upon my life. There's many gifts in this room, but not very few people have accepted what they carry. The gifting is there, but you haven't accepted. This has got nothing to do with man. This is accepting what God has put upon your life. Seven years ago, the Lord called me specifically to the prophetic. One morning he said, Andre, I'm calling you to be a prophet. I said, Lord, I don't want to, I'll just be Andre. I don't want to be a prophet. I don't like titles. Titles are like a bar of soap. The more you use it, the smaller it gets. So I said, I don't like titles, just Andre. And then God said to me, but what if that is what I want to call you? Will you be that? And something happened because I prophesied for many years, but suddenly I accepted it. I said, okay, I accept what you have for me. And when I accepted it, the authority level in my life went to a different level. He says, silver or gold, I don't have. 
but what I have. Today I can prophesy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, any time, any place, any nation. There's a, I've accepted the gift upon my life. I st I'm still led by the Holy Spirit. I don't do anything uh, if the Holy Spirit doesn't lead me to do it. But I've accepted the gift upon my life. I don't put it on and off. I don't have to pray fast, sing any, no longer to activate the gift. The gift is upon my life. I accepted it. I carry it on me. I don't have to pray an hour in tongues to prophesy. Anytime, any place, I've accepted what I carry. I'm asking you tonight, have you accepted what you carry? Have you accepted the gift? Have you accepted the anointing that he's placed upon your life? Nothing with people. You don't have to stand up in front of people and say, well, I'm accepting that I have the gift of healing. This is between you and God where you say, Lord, I accept the gift you've placed upon my life. And suddenly I can step out in a different position because I'm ready to, dis I'm ready to release the gift. The enemy does not want the body of Christ to realize what they carry. Number two, he doesn't want them to release it. Therefore, there's an attack upon our identity that people spend a lifetime, a lifetime to restore their identity, to find their identity in things. Where when it comes to the gifting, it's not about us anymore. It's about him. <laughs> it doesn't matter what people think about me and my identity. It's, it's Christ in me that's the hope of glory now. I'm not limited. He's not limited to me, what he can do. I don't have to pray and say, God, I pray that your spirit flow through me tonight without any hindrance or any limitation. I pray that I'll be open vessel. Christ in me cannot be more open than he is right now. I've, I'm not relying on my ability, my strength, my stamina. I'm relying on him. I'm just a vessel for him to, to flow through. I'm accepting what he wants to do upon my life. Now, let me explain the invitations to you, and I'm ending with this. Matthew 14, verse 28, he says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it's you, invite me. See, Peter understands that he needs an invitation to function in the supernatural. He doesn't have the ability to walk on water. But if he invites him, he empowers him. You see, the invitation carries the power. Within the invitation, the supernatural power is contained within that invitation. And so when you respond to that invitation, we don't respond to invitations because we think that we, we don't have the capacity. But what you don't re realize, it is the invitation that gives you the capacity. So you get the invitation, you're thinking, well, it's too big, I can do it. I don't have the resources, I don't have the ability, I don't have the gifting, I can do it. But it is in the invitation that the power is carried to manifest that power within your life. And so at that moment, so what you have to realize, people are, there's many sermons about, what about all the others in the boat? I mean, no one of, none of them are even attempting to walk on water. At that moment, he is the only one that is authorized to walk on water. He says, if it's you, invite me. Tell me to come. And when he invites him, he empowers him. Now let me explain something to you about angels. In the spiritual realm that's around us right now, there's a currency that flows within the spiritual realm. The currency in this spirit realm around us is faith. That is the currency. That is the language the language in the spirit is faith. God hears faith. I want to say to you, someone was very upset recently with me because I said that God hears our prayers, but he responds to faith. He is when we pray. But when we act in faith, God responds. That is the currency. In the spiritual world, your maturity is not measured by your doctrine or qualifications, but by your faith. When angels look at you, they don't see your qualifications, where you come from, your background, they see your faith. Now let me share a secret with you. Angels respond 
to risky faith. If you want to be, if you want to have angels in the room, we have to function in risky faith. What is risky faith? Risky faith means that when I step out of that boat, I position myself as far away from that boat as possible. A lot of us, when the invitation comes, we step out of the boat, but then we have one foot in the boat and one outside. Plan B. If this doesn't work, I can still go back. I can still stay back. It's not, it's not faith. <laughs> Risky faith is I step as far away from that boat as possible. And in that moment, it's God. The only thing that I have now is you. I believe that Andre can share with you when it comes to miracles. We call it the working of miracles. When that miracle, when we, we, when we receive a word of knowledge, we can position ourselves in that word of knowledge. Here's this, God speaks about a sick person that he wants to heal. We can play it safe or we can have risky faith. Risky faith is we take that step forward to into the direction of that. Suddenly it puts us in the spot where all the attention is upon us. God's plan when it comes to the giftings is not to make you popular. It's not to make you famous. It's not to put you in the front cover of the newspaper. That's not God's intention. He wants the glory for what he does. And so if you are scared about your reputation, you have to stop serving God. If you're still concerned about what will people think, then Christianity is not for you. Because God's going to put you in places and situations where you're going to feel, well, <laughs> what, what if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't work? What if I missed it? We'll be in those positions. But it's risky faith. And angels respond to that place, to that situation. I want to say to you prophetically, 2022 is going to be a year of great risks. Great risks. And that risk is spelled faith. You're going to have to take steps where <laughs> you can lose everything if it doesn't work out. You're going to have to take steps where you have, you're going to have to make yourself vulnerable, expose yourself, feel naked, feel exposed, feel, well, every, all the eyes are on me right now. It's a year of risky faith. But I'm here tonight to say to you that God will not disappoint you. God will not disappoint you. That his power will arise at that moment and that he will carry you. There's invitations that are going to come this week. There's invitations coming today where God is speaking to you. He's showing you something. And you have to respond to that when it comes. When the invitation comes, you have to respond. What is he saying? I want to end tonight. I want you to write down three things. Write down three things. Number one. What is God saying? Number two, when are you going to respond? Number three, how are you going to respond? Number one, what is God saying? Number two, when are you going to respond? Number three, how are you going to respond? God's speaking to you, not just on this conference. The last week, the last couple of months, God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. God is, you are in 2022 right now. God's already in 2024. He's busy speaking to you about the future. Where you, what's happening? What is God saying? You don't, have to be, you don't have to be confused by that. You can know that this is what God's saying to me. Whether people understand it or not, this is what he's saying to me. Number two, when are you going to respond? Put a date on it. And how are you going to respond? Let me explain it to you practically. God speaks to you. He says, I'm sending you to Ethiopia to go and feed a thousand families. That's what God's saying to me, number one. Number two, when are you going to respond? Well, I'm busy for the next three months. I don't, can't do it now. But 1st of July, I'll go. The first moment when you go from the invitation and you respond, suddenly the supernatural power of God is released and you are busy gaining momentum as soon as you set that date. First of July, I'm going. 
How are you going to respond? Well, right now I don't have money to feed a thousand families. But what I will do is I'll feed 10 families. That's what I'm going to do. God's saying I have to go there. Number two, I'm going to go the 1st of July. And I'm how? 10 families. I'm telling you, by the time that you arrive in Ethiopia, the resources will be there to feed a thousand families. But most of us are scared because of the magnitude of the vision. You're thinking, well, that's big. Rather send you Andre, let him do it. <laughs> there's, there's someone else, Father, you made the wrong address. There's someone else, Lord, I'll pray that Andre hears you and he gets the vision to go and feed those families. Inc. is wealthy. He's very wealthy. He's got the money. He, he can feed people. I don't have the money to do that. You know, when I pray, it takes six months. Lord, when Inc. prays, you hear, immediately you hear him. <laughs> so speak to Inc. And suddenly we, we, we pass the vision on to other people. We got the word, but then, no, no that person is better. They better qualify. Those are the invitations. When you miss that invitation, going to have to wait season for that invitation to come. The invitations that I'm speaking about tonight is not one invitation in 10 years. These invitations are continually coming to us. On a daily basis, invitations are coming. Consistently, they're coming. They've got different seasons connected to them, but they're coming the whole time. If we can just learn to respond to that invitation. There's a guy that's on the street corner. The picture comes into your mind. I need to get food for that guy. It's an invitation. I'll do it later. It's an invitation. Respond to it. Respond to that invitation. God's speaking to many people about the same thing, but don't think, well, because he's speaking to many, I don't have to do it. When you respond to invitation, suddenly you open up your life where God wants to do something in a town or city that he will firstly come and knock on your door because he knows that you will do it. When I look at David's life, you know, <laughs> David, if David would show up in church tomorrow morning, most churches would not allow David to preach out of the same book that he wrote because of his lifestyle. He will not be permitted. They won't invite him. You agree? Remember, David broke 14 of the Ten Commandments. I mean, he, <laughs> he lived there. Did many, many stupid things. But then God speaks about him and he says, I found him to be a man after my own heart. I could never understand that. And then in Acts, he says, says why? He says, because he would do everything that I ask him to do. He's responding to invitations. Invitations. When God speaks to someone in the city, he's ready to go. He's ready to respond. Doesn't matter what is required. He will do it. He will go. The things that I'm speaking to you about right now, I see invitations in the room. God's speaking to you. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to you. A dream without a response is going to remain a dream. A vision without a response will only be a vision. Only when you respond to that, it is activated. To respond with what you have in the capacity that you can. Don't be concerned about the magnitude of it. Just do it. Just, just step in that direction. As soon as you move in that direction, the supernatural is activated in that moment. Amen. I can go on and on for hours, but we'll, we'll start to minister now. I want to share a vision that I had with you. I believe it's applicable for where we are right now. Three years ago, the Lord spoke to me. One morning I woke up, and in the spirit I saw a guard, a soldier, a guard standing. And I saw this guard stepping down and a change take place and a new guard takes his place. And when I saw that, the Lord spoke to me and said, Andre, the guard is changing globally. The guard is changing. Now, let me explain the guard to you. A spiritual guard within a region functions in authority or in power for approximately 40 years. A spiritual guard. A spiritual guard is the authority. It's a pastor. It's someone that oversees a network. It's an apostolic leader. It's someone that sees, oversees a city, a 
province or a nation. That is the spiritual guard. So we have many spiritual guards in South Africa. Those are people that are in that capacity. And so God said to me, the guard is changing. It means that the spiritual guard that has been in power for the last 40 years are retiring, they are stepping down, they are dying. And the shift is taking place. Now, when it comes to the spiritual guard, God, God is a God of authority. When it comes to the spiritual guard, the beliefs of that person will affect an entire city. If you have a pastor, a leader, that are stepping up as the spiritual guard, and they do not believe in miracles, it will stop the flow of miracles within their church, within their organization, within their network. As so God spoke to me, he said, Andre, don't complain about the new guard if you did not do anything about it. I said, Lord, what can I do? And God said, you can pray. That the spiritual guard believes in the fivefold. That they believe in the supernatural. Because when that individual believes in the supernatural, it unlocks prophecy over a city. Healing over a city. And we are in that season right now with a new guard are busy standing up. Churches, new pastors, new leaders, new networks are being birthed. New leaders in nations, in cities. They're busy stepping up globally. Switzerland, the guard stepped down in Switzerland. A complete new guard stepped up last two years. They're busy. Busy stepping into their positions. What we are going to do right now is we are going to pray for the new guard. What we're going to pray is that they are men and women that believes in the supernatural, that believes in the fivefold, that believes in healing, that believes in prophecy, that believes in overflow, that believes in prosperity, that believes in the power of God. And I believe that as we pray right now, that heaven will hear our prayers. And God will put people within power that will open the supernatural, not close it. That will open places. So new people are stepping into those positions. Pastor Andre is part of the new spiritual guard. He stepped into his position into what God wants to do. There's, a, there's an apostolic anointing upon his life and God's busy expanding, doing something that God is shifting his territory, his boundaries, breaking down any limitation. He's stepping into his position. And so I thank God for a pastor that believes in the supernatural because it will make it possible for many others to function in that same area of his authority in the supernatural because he believes in it. Why do I say he believes in it? Because he creates and invites people to a conference. He doesn't just speak about it, he does it. People, many people that say, I believe in it, I believe in it, but they don't do anything. <laughs> he creates room for it. He promotes it, he believes in it. He doesn't close the door and say, no, no. He says, no, Father, we want more of you. We want more of you. Same thing with Inc. He's part of the new guard. Believes in the supernatural. Opens up a region. I'm telling you the death that has been in regions and in places because of the authority that he carries, he will open up a region for healing to come to that region. Wealth to come to that region. Healing, restoration to come to that region. I mean, the, what I saw, uh, 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 when I saw Hink, I saw a desert suddenly turned into an oasis. The most wicked, dirty place on earth. Suddenly, life comes to that place. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. It's authority. It comes into that, into that place. Because of what he carries, because of what he believes in, he creates the land responds to it. The environment responds to it. Because of what he carries. We are going to pray for the guard. I want you to understand that what we are praying for right now will affect every one of us in this room. It will affect East London. It will affect this province. 
it will affect South Africa. We need leaders that opens heaven. Not people that closes, that limits a place, but that opens the place for the Holy Spirit to say, come and move within this place. Come and move within this arena. Amen?